Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Defend Your Data Now with the MITRE ATT&CK Framework. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of today's webcast. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentation will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you're experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Time permitting, we will have a Q&A session during the last portion of the presentation. And feel free to submit comments via this widget as well. For links to downloadable PDFs pertinent to today's conversation, click on the Resource widget. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast. So now let's get on with the presentation. A bit about our speaker. Our presenter today is Travis Smith. Travis is a principal security researcher at Tripwire. He has over 10 years of experience in security, holds an MBA with a concentration in information security, and multiple certifications including CISSP and GPEN. Travis specializes in integrating various technologies and processes with a passion for forensics and security analytics with the goal of helping customers identify and mitigate real threats. So now, without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Travis Smith. Take it away, Travis. Thanks, Kate. I'm a researcher here at Tripwire, and I focus on detecting various attack vectors that we as defenders face on a daily basis. Today I'll be speaking about how we can leverage the MITRE ATT&CK framework in your organization. I'll go over a few of the uh, various compliance and security frameworks as well and link them back to the ATT&CK framework so you can see how you may already have a head start in leveraging the ATT&CK framework. So let's get started. This was a Twitter debate that happened a few weeks back. There are some controls which we'll discuss in a minute which state that basic controls are going to prevent up to around 96% or so of attacks. Meanwhile, who's to say that the attacks on paper would have been prevented completely? A dedicated attacker could have then just changed their tactics to get into the organization. I'll go over some of the basic cyber hygiene tactics that we are talking about here today. So keep this thought in the back of your mind as a frame of reference for the rest of the session today. This is Gartner's Adaptive Security Architecture. It's a great image which describes the overall workflow of what security professionals are going to, going to need to do in order to harden or secure their systems. It's not just a one-time job of installing a perimeter firewall and next-gen antivirus. That's something you could have gotten away with in 2004, but definitely not here in 2018. From a prediction standpoint, there is one word that stands out more than any other, and that's baseline. When you're talking about detecting attacks and threat hunting, having a baseline of what is normal is critical. Imagine getting handed a hard drive and a note that says, tell me what's wrong with this computer. Where do you start? The same goes when scaling up to an environment with thousands, even 10,000s of machines. Even a baseline or a golden image will speed up threat hunting and incident response in later sections of this quadrant. However, ideally, this section is more about anticipating what an attacker is going to do and feed that information into your prevention strategy. For prevention, hardening is key here. Reducing the attack surface is what you're after. I don't think I'm preaching anything novel here when I say that securing a server and disabling unnecessary services is going to improve security. However, prediction is going to feed prevention, even more so in a mature and complex environment. It's also going to identify how to detect, since you're now limiting what the attack surface needs to be monitored. Knowing the attack surface can help limit what needs to be monitored, which will improve the detection rates. Even better, the carousel keeps on going on what gets detected is then feed, fed into how you respond to an event. From a response perspective, eliminating the threat on the detected machines is the first step usually. There's always going to be cases where you need to actually skip steps here and make changes to the environment to monitor a threat actor or change mitigation strategies before completely eliminating the threat. However, going from a high-level perspective, you'll eventually remediate the threat and feed that retrospective analysis into the prediction machine on the top left and start the process all over again to make sure that this type of attack doesn't happen again. 
I start with this image because it's the most high level and abstract of what we'll be discussing today. It's also a great way to visualize what security organizations need to accomplish. This is not a one-time expense. There's no silver bullet. It's a continual process which feeds into itself until the end of time. In a similar manner to the Gartner Adaptive Security Architecture, Robert Lee from SANS released a great reference model he calls the sliding scale of cybersecurity. This roughly defines where an organization fits at in a high level in terms of their security maturity. The previous slide talked about where we're, what we're doing, and this slide talks about where we are. The return on investment on the lower end, the green architecture section, will be much higher than the upper end, the, re the red offensive section. Similarly, the pyramid builds upon each other. So you're going to get a higher return on investment on passive defense when you have a solid foundation of architecture to build upon. Then you'll have a higher return on investment on active defense when you build that on top of the solid foundation of passive defense, which then relied on the architecture. If your organization hasn't built or maintained architecture or passive defense, you're going to find diminishing returns on active defense and above. So you should not attempt to get into intelligence or offense until these foundations are built and improved upon. If you're not familiar with the sliding scale of cybersecurity, there's a great white paper on the SANS website. It's only about 10 pages, and it's really entertaining. So if your brain shut off when I said white paper, it's actually a really good read. The goal of the architecture phase is to establish a base for which the other security components can be built upon later. It's not just the planning and establishing that are important, but it must also incorporate the general upkeep, such as installing the latest patches and reviewing the network to make sure that there's no new systems creeping into areas that they should not be in. If the network is left wide open and riddled with known vulnerabilities, it's going to make the defender's job much harder than it would have been if you had proper network segmentation, system hardening, and patching was done on a routine basis. As I mentioned before, we want to increase the cost of ownership. All too often, we read about security breaches where proper network segmentation, hardening, or even just installing patches within 6, 12, or even 18 months could have prevented the attack. Architecture is what everything is built upon later. So without proper foundation, any additional secure security controls we're going to install later will eventually fail. Passive defense is adding security components to the systems you've already hardened. In the last section, we would have hardened Windows by enabling the security of built-in features or reducing the, uh, reducing the attack surface by disabling unnecessary service. In this section, these systems should you know, add protection, uh, eliminate security gaps left over from the architecture phase, uh, reduce the probability of a threat, uh, and give insight into the attacker's behavior. You can use these with things like firewalls, antivirus products, uh, uh, IDS or IPS machines on the network, and, and really building in the defense in depth uh, within your organization. When combined with a proper architecture, these two components will hopefully slow down an attacker to the point that they're either going to give up or can be detected by the logs being collected. Time is the one resource that you can deplete from an attacker. I don't really like relating cyber attacks to kinetic attacks, uh, but when you compare it up against to a kinetic attack, you can eventually deplete the resources of an adversary. They only have so many bullets and bombs they can throw at you. Eventually, the barrage will end. Uh, in a digital attack, uh, you know, they never run out of you know, cyber bullets or cyber bombs. Um, you know, they can continually fire those at you. Time is the only thing you can take away from the attacker. So hardening the systems uh, and installing passive defensive tools in a defensive in-depth solu uh, layered solution will increase the amount of uh, resources required for an adversary to eventually achieve their objective. However, make sure that if you are doing defensive uh, in-depth in a layered manner, uh, that the same techniques that they're using to bypass one layer cannot be used to bypass the next layers. Uh, it would be completely eliminate any return on investment from in investing in multiple security technologies. Uh, if you have a million dollars worth of network intrusion detection and prevention tools and next-gen firewalls and deep packet analysis, uh, protecting, protecting a kiosk running Windows XP with all of the USB ports enabled, you're probably going to have a bad time. If the system is turned on, it probably has the possibility of being breached, regardless of how well the architecture and passive defensive uh, are implemented. Uh, a determined and well-funded adversary will have the ability to bypass most security protections. However, a determined and well-funded well -funded defender can counter any of these adversaries. The first step is you need to gather the logs. That's mission critical. It's step one. Um, you know, if not step 1.5. These logs are going to enable your organization to actually detect events happening, happening on the network. Uh, when one is found, the organization will neutralize threats by eliminating it from the environment, uh, determining the infection vector, and close the gap where the attacker was able to get in. Uh, there's a lot of different maturity models within this uh, phase. So at the beginning, you may want to detect a piece of malware on an endpoint and wipe the machine or delete the piece of malware with an endpoint security tool. 
uh, more mature organizations will also hunt out for the existence of that piece of malware elsewhere on the network. Uh, at the, pin pin uh, the pinnacle of this maturity, uh, you may want to actually leave the piece of malware in place and monitor what it's trying to do. Uh, if it is a rat, is it stealing sensitive information uh, from a database? Is it communicating with other machines on the network uh, or communicating with other hosts uh, on the Internet? Uh, answering these questions in a meaningful amount of time can help detect the scope of the br uh, breach and prevent you from playing a game of whack-a-mole where the attacker is getting in elsewhere on the network. An act of defense means that you may want to d uh, direct the attacker to a specific area of the network, uh, prevent them from utilizing part of their exploit kit and force them out of their comfort zone. An attacker is used, uh, used to using the same set of TTPs, their tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, they're ingrained into their psyche. Uh, if they're coming in via a tour and you block the, you know, the tour from you know, coming into your network, uh, they may use a less uh, anonymous VPN service. Uh, if you block their use of user account control bypasses, uh, they may try to use other exploits, further shedding light into their activities. Uh, active defense can be a very powerful tool in the defender's arsenal. Uh, however, this is where most organizations are going to stop in terms of the sliding scale of cybersecurity. Most organizations will not reach this phase. This requires a well-funded and mature organization. It's not about consuming threat intelligence uh, security into security tools. This is more about generating the intelligence to share internally or externally. Uh, the goal of this phase is to collect information about the adversary, their TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, or their tools and analyze that information into a piece of intelligence that can then be shared. Uh, as I stated in the active defense stage, the previous stage, it takes a high level of maturity to actually force an attacker to change their tactics and force them to move elsewhere within the environment. If you're able to do that, then this stage should be attainable. Uh, if you're at this level, threat intel is going to be your friend. Uh, find a ISAC um, and a geographic region or a market vertical that you're in, uh, but be sure to share your findings as well as consuming the findings for everyone else. The offense is what we would call hacking back. Unless you're a government entity, you will not legally be reaching this phase. Uh, this phase is where actions are taken against an adversary outside of our friendly network, so not within your own organization or some type of uh, infrastructure that you own. Uh, active defense would be eliminating the piece of malware from your environment or blocking the command and control server at perimeter firewalls. Uh, offense would be attacking the command and control server and trying to take that offline. Uh, because attribution is incredibly hard, it's really unwise for organizations to attempt to reach this phase. It takes an incredible amount of resources to understand where an attacker is coming from and if they actually own the hardware from which the attack is coming from. Imagine an attacker breached a public entity, say a bank or a public utility, and launched their campaign from that infected network. Uh, it would not be wise to then try to take that bank or uh, public utility offline. So at the beginning of this presentation, I promised I would tie all of these together instead of just preaching where you can find them online. So hang with me. Uh, it's going to feel like I'm hunting for, or hunting for Pepe Silvia while connecting all of these frameworks together. First, I took the Gartner Adaptive Security Architecture and used that as my basis for mapping things together. Uh, this is going to be the basis for the x-axis across the top here. Uh, I like this because everything we do in the security world comes down to preventing an attack, detecting an attack, or responding to an attack. Uh, I just combine the response and remediation steps since these are more similar when looking at how they map to everything else. Then I stole, stole the return on investment portion from the sliding scale of cybersecurity to map things on the y-axis. Uh, from here, I'm attempting to map the return on investment from the highest on the top to the lowest on the bottom. Uh, so the architecture phase of the sliding scale of, our, of uh, cybersecurity uh, is going to be in the top, and they're going to follow all the way down that pyramid. So architecture is then built, uh, the next path to that is passive defense, followed by active defense, intelligence, and then offense, and then mapped into how they map to prevention, detection, or remediation. While the adaptive security architecture and sliding scale are great abstract concepts to think about, most of us at the tactical level need guidance on how to actually implement them. The, the best place to start when trying to secure an enterprise for the first time are the Center for Internet Security, uh, uh, Critical Security Controls, formerly known as the SANS Top 20 from a few years back. These do a great job of prioritizing what an organization should do at the first level of coverage when securing their assets. What's nice is that they break them down into basic, foundational, and organizational controls, basic being 1 through 6, foundational being 7 through 16, and organizational being 17 through 20. Uh, these can be leveraged by organizations both large and small. However, 
while they do provide more guidance than, say, the SAN sliding scale architecture, uh, it leaves a lot of the implement implementation details up to the local organization that's implementing them. Uh, the downside is that this looks like it'd be a lot to take on for an information security department, which is already understaffed and overworked. There's uh, 20 of these controls listed, uh, and then each of these controls can have, have dozens of sub-items uh, for each control. These controls are fairly high level, leaving the inter interpretation of how to implement them or what tools to use uh, up to you. If you remember from the first slide, I mentioned that organizations that followed the basic cyber hygiene can prevent uh, upwards of 96, 97% of attacks against their organization, and this is where that stat comes from. Uh, the Pareto principle is that 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Uh, taking a small portion of all security actions you, uh, you can take yields a large percentage of benefit. Um, the first 20% uh, of uh, CIS controls can block 80-ish percent of the attacks. Uh, so the first five controls, this is based on version 6 of the research they did, uh, implementing those first five uh, is going to stop 85% of your attacks. If you implement all 20, you're going to stop 97% of your attacks. And this is why CIS easily provides the first five, uh, and maybe even six now, of the critical security controls on their website for anybody that you look at. The effort uh, to protection ratio is tremendous for these basic controls, while the additional 15 uh, produce another 12% or so of protection. Uh, if I told you that you're headed into a war zone to, to fix the Wi-Fi, and just pretend with me for a minute here, uh, we've all had someone call us with Wi-Fi problems. Uh, so you're preparing to go in, and they tell you that, you know, ignore the bulletproof vest uh, because there's a guy out there who knows kung fu and the vest isn't going to help at all. Uh, but what about the other 500 folks out there with guns? Uh, it's the same thing with cyber hygiene. Uh, don't ignore cyber hygiene just because there's one guy that can get in around those other, you know, basic controls. So getting back to the matrix we have here. Uh, we can, now we can add in the CIS controls. Uh, instead of splitting them into each individual control, which probably would have been a little bit more accurate, I instead split them up by their high-level grouping of basic, foundational, and organizational, just to save space in this slide. Here we can see that the basic controls are most closely aligned in the architecture phase, uh, where doing a basis is necessary to enable later controls. The foundational controls are a little bit more advanced and would evenly be split up between passive defense and active defense. However, when you average them out, they fall roughly somewhere in the middle of those two. Finally, I put the organizational controls near the bottom, as it takes a really mature security organization to effectively implement these along the same lines as an effective organization needing to implement the intelligence phase, uh, for example. Chances are, your organization has to follow some type of compliance framework to do business within your industry. Uh, these are much more prescriptive when it comes uh, down to what actually needs to be done at a tactical level. The problem is that they are much more reactive to today's threats. That being said, they're still valuable in providing the foundations of a good security architecture. If you recall, when we were talking about applying a solid architecture, implementing security frameworks and compliance frameworks was on the list for establishing that initial baseline. This is a poster which is available from the Center for Internet Security uh, based on the previous set of critical security controls, so version 6, not the version 7 we're currently on. Uh, some things have changed between version 6 and version 7, but overall it still fits uh, the latest release from last, uh, last month or a couple months ago. Here's how the widely adopted 20 security controls map to various uh, compliance frameworks such as NIST 853 or PCI, HIPAA, uh, or NERC CIP. So the various compliance frameworks, it's very difficult to see here, uh, but those are the columns that you see across, whereas the top 20 controls are the rows that you see here. Um, so the, the wide one kind of in the middle is HIPAA, and you can see if you are following HIPAA, um, you are mapped to you know, roughly 15 of the top 20 controls already. Uh, so you can overlay these with the Gartner Adaptive Security Arch Architecture and see which ones are really need to, needing to be focused on from a prediction, prevention, detection, or a response mechanism. Uh, so prediction is really, you know, two or three of the, of the top five, followed by the, the final one on the bottom. Uh, prevention covers a great amount of the critical security controls. So for, you know, over half of the controls are uh, focused on prevention. Uh, detection, again, is, is, is littered out throughout here, mostly with uh, analyzing logs and, and analyzing data in that manner. And then a couple on how to respond, whether that is uh, responding to something like ransomware or doing some type of incident response program and continually up updating that within your organization. Simply put, compliance is primarily focused on prevention. Uh, there's some of the controls, such as you know, enabling logging, 
Uh, however, the vast majority of these controls in the frameworks were locking down the assets. Uh, compliance is very reactionary, so it's going to focus on preventing known attacks, not on preventing or detecting unknown ones. Uh, it's probably a little less return on investment when looking at something like a passive defense. Uh, however, uh, you're going to need to uh, comply with these various frameworks, for example, PCI, before you can even do business. So it actually, the return on investment for the business itself is going to be much higher uh, than some of the other controls simply from a business perspective. While the critical security controls are great at defining at a high level uh, what the objectives are on where to focus uh, from security operations, uh, hardening guides is where you want to start when actually hardening the critical assets. Uh, for most private organizations, the Center for Internet Security has their hardening guidelines uh, that you want to reference. Uh, if you are a government entity or do business with the government, you may want to use the DISA STIGs. Uh, which are just the, the government version of a, the same hardening guideline. Uh, for all the critical assets in your environment from the endpoints, servers, uh, supporting networking equipment, critical applications, even cloud providers, uh, there's hardening guidelines for all of these. Uh, all of our Tripart content is based off of these guides. We have hardening guidelines for CIS and DISA. Uh, a lot of our content for something like PCI or HIPAA uh, then references back to what is referenced within these guides. Uh, so they're very powerful. Uh, if you haven't looked at them at a detailed level. And as I mentioned, a lot of our compliance frameworks uh, pull inspiration from these hardening guidelines. Uh, so uh, if you're going to implement a hardening benchmark uh, first, you're already going to have the coverage you need uh, for a compliance framework uh, for what your organization needs to address. I slid everything di uh, down a bit here and put the hardening uh, right above compliance and architecture. Uh, in reality, hardening should be part of the architecture phase. So it's much easier to bake security into the organization from the beginning than it would be to try to uh, cherry-pick controls in the DISA STIG and uh, try to make sure they don't have a negative impact on mission-critical systems. Uh, but not all of us are fortunate enough to build an enterprise-class network uh, and security organization from the beginning of the organization. Uh, so we have to go through and add those in later. Uh, so hardening really fits in right between uh, implementing these basic controls and trying to focus on the compliance uh, that your organization has to face. Lockheed Martin Cyber Threat Kill Chain is a great way to describe the overall process that an attacker is going to go through over the course of their campaign. Uh, they're going to start with reconnaissance uh, and see what uh, systems you have on your network that they want to attack. Uh, they're going to weaponize those attacks based on what you have in your organization, uh, get it to you in some way via email or uh, exploiting a web uh, front-end application, uh, perform that exploitation, and install their malware, uh, control what they want to do, pivot across the environment maybe, and then eventually take their action on an objectives, whether that's stealing data, installing ransomware, uh, doing a denial of service campaign. So it's a really good way of describing what an attacker is going to do. Uh, but what I, what I like to do is compare it to the pain chart you see at the doctor's office, because it match, actually matches up really closely with the cyber kill chain. Uh, when an attacker is going to be doing a recon against you, it's not really that painful. Uh, there's really no way you can limit that attack vector. Uh, as you, you've got to have that information about your organization online just to do business. Uh, but as you move a, across the, the kill chain, uh, it starts to get a little bit more painful uh, as they're weaponizing and delivering, uh, exploiting you, uh, installing malware, and then getting you know, command and control on your environment. Uh, that's when you're really going to start crying. Uh, and what gets you know, the most painful is then uh, when you get a call from Brian Krebs telling you that you've been, been breached. Uh, so the fact that I want to iterate here is that you want to stop an attack sooner rather than later. The same way you prefer to go to a doctor and discover and fix a problem when you're smiling rather than when you're crying. Hardening guides and compliance framework can, frameworks can do a lot to mitigate the first half of this kill chain, uh, but they lack a lot in the later parts. And that's why I really love the attack framework. For those who are not familiar with the attack framework, uh, it's from MITRE, uh, the same organization that does you know, CVEs for vulnerabilities. Uh, and attack stands for Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. So what attack is, is it's a repository, a curated knowledge base of 11 tactics that uh, adversaries are commonly going to use. And within these tactics, they have hundreds of sort of techniques for each phase of that kill chain. And each one of these techniques has methodologies that uh, you can mitigate or detect that specific technique. Uh, and they're all based off of real world uses. Uh, uses. Uh, so they all reference back to published articles of uh, APT groups or malware, uh, which is using this specific technique. Um, what I really love about it is that they have all of this curated set of knowledge. Uh, these aren't really a theoretical attack vector uh, that can come from a you know, intelligent security research team or a university program. 
uh, the link back to each example, each detection, or each mitigation strategy, and it documents why this is important and how to stop it. When looking at how the attack framework maps into the cyber Lockheed kill chain, uh, it's more of later in the cycle, so after an attacker already has a foothold on the environment. Uh, this can seem scary to some, but as defenders we know um, attackers are going to bypass some of our defenses. Uh, there's companies which spend millions and millions of dollars on security and are still getting attacked uh, successfully. Uh, it's important to be able to know uh, how adversaries are going to try to work within uh, inside our walls so we can try to eradicate them as soon as possible. While the cyber kill chain above is somewhat of a linear path, they're going to start at reconnaissance and move the way to the right all the way to actions on objective. Uh, the attack tactics uh, are in no specific order. An adversary may start with discovery and move to execution, uh, while another, another may start with defensive evasion and move on to command and control. Uh, so when adopting attack, uh, it's a great model to understand your defenses in order to plug the holes uh, where you're most exposed. So let me explain. What you see here is a listing of the tactics and techniques from the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And this is available on their website, attack.mitre.org. Uh, so this poster is available there, uh, and this is actually based off of the January update. The April update from this year now includes a, another tactic column, so now there's 11, uh, but it's already hard enough to see everything on the screen. Um, so the framework here uh, has tactics that an adversary will follow. That's across the top row, those are the blue cells across the top. Uh, then each tactic has a set of techniques in the columns underneath. And each one of these techniques defines the set of procedures that an attacker is going to use. So combine these tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs, uh, are when an attacker is going to leverage. As a defender, it's our goal to detect these TTPs rather than leveraging threat information, such as malicious file hashes or IP addresses or domain names. Uh, those pieces of data are easily detected, but they're also trivial for an attacker to change. If you look closely enough, techniques can be used across various tactics. So the first three columns are a great example of how multiple techniques are listed across multiple tactics. Uh, we can dig into each one of these techniques to get an example of the type of information that we can gather. Uh, one important thing to note is that a, uh, these tactics don't map up to the cyber kill chain in chronolo chronological order as I described. Uh, an attacker is going to begin with execution and move to command and control, then laterally move across the environment, then maintain persistence, then exfiltrate data. Uh, so don't think of this matrix as starting on the top left and working way to the bottom right. It's more about finding where your gaps are and addressing those uh, to meet the needs of your organization. Here's an example of an individual technique available from the attack framework. This is the Windows Accessibility Features technique. Uh, so on the top right, we can get valuable information about what this technique pertains to. Uh, for example, which platforms are affected, uh, what data sources we need to gather to either detect or mitigate this uh, specific technique. Uh, and the attack framework is easily split out between Windows and Linux and Mac platforms. Uh, so depending on what orga your organizational, organizational architecture looks like, there should be some type of coverage within this framework. Uh, the top section describes information about what this technique, technique is. Uh, for example, uh, how an attacker would use it and some of the technical details which might be important. Uh, the next section down is the examples portion, and this is where it lists out uh, the real threat actors or malware campaigns uh, which use this technique. And then notice that each one has a, a reference to a public article. Uh, so you can actually, if you need to get approval for uh, implementing this technique within your organization, you can say, okay, this is the threat actor that used this, or this is the malware campaign that's uh, using this specific technique. Uh, to be able to justify um, you know, spending resources to address this specific technique. Uh, and then the next two sections is where a lot of the value comes, uh, in my opinion, from the attack framework. Uh, these are the, the mitigation and the detection uh, sections. So it's very powerful as defenders to take this information and then use it within their organization. What we've done here at Tripwire is taken the attack framework and done a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, we have policies for every Windows platform and ma the major Linux platforms, uh, and the policies are doing a very deep inspection of your endpoints uh, for each of the techniques in which we have coverage for. Uh, for each one of these techniques, uh, Tripwire Enterprise can tell you if you have hardened your system appro appropriately uh, to mitigate that specific technique, uh, as well as provide insights uh, if your endpoint has seen some type of attack uh, based off of the uh, detection guidance. From a policy perspective, it's much more uh, provides much more context to the endpoint security status uh, over traditional integrity monitoring. Uh, now a failed policy test on uh, detecting an attack is much more critical to inspect uh, than a file change on an endpoint. These policies are much larger, uh, almost nearly twice as large, in fact, than our previous policy tests that you may have used, such as uh, CIS or PCI. 
That's because we're doing much more analysis uh, of the data than your, tra your traditional compliance or security frameworks would. The current attack policy content is split out into a folder structure for each individual technique, so a single cell within the attack matrix. Uh, the next release, uh, we're going to be then splitting these out into subfolders for detection and mitigation to make that reporting engine a little bit easier. Uh, this is done to prevent duplicating policy tests, which can map across multiple tactics. Uh, so now we'll just use the reporting engine to visualize the various tactics and split out the mitigation versus detection tests, and we can cover that in a little bit. Uh, we can even look at what we're supposed to have coverage for. Uh, in the case here, uh, there's two policy tests for the scheduled task technique, uh, which this organization is supposed to have coverage for. However, uh, we can see that one of the policy tests is failing. Uh, the other one is passing. Uh, that may be okay due to compensating controls, or it may be an issue that the organization needs to address. Um, and as with all of the content that Tripwire Enterprise provides, uh, if the organization needs to address any of the failures that we see from a policy test, we can provide detailed instructions on how uh, to remediate the various endpoints that have that failure. While the policies are great, there's going to be some items and elements on an endpoint which cannot be inspected by an automated system. Any threat hunting team uh, will need to have humans to analyze some data. Uh, the rules that we have associated with the attack framework uh, are designed to weed out the noise so uh, any analyst can inspect what is really important on these endpoints. Much of what was used to create the attack policies and rule sets were taken from our existing change audit, uh, critical change audit, and cybercrime controls. Uh, Tripwire has a deep history of detecting change on the endpoints for uh, a greater part of two decades now. Uh, and of providing insight into these endpoints. Uh, so leveraging the attack framework as content is just the next step within our journey. We can take a look at detection rules in place to see, you know, in this example, a new scheduled task being created. Uh, these are just traditional integrity monitoring rules which alert you if something suspicious has changed. Some of these may uh, expect a change under normal operating uh, procedures, such as critical system files, which would get updated when you install a uh, Windows patch on a Microsoft Tuesday. Um, others should never change, uh, such as you know, software being installed on a critical server. Uh, the content now has priorities uh, and severities associated with each item being checked. Uh, so those which are expected to change less, uh, less often will have a higher priority scoring associated to them, uh, helping administrators filter out the noise and focus on what's important. Uh, util utilizing some of our other add-ons, such as our dynamic software reconciliation or whitelist profiler uh, with on, the, on the Tripwire Enterprise server can also help uh, eliminate some of this background noise and amplify the abilities of your security operations team. From a reporting standpoint, uh, there's dozens of reports to visualize and expose changed elements and policy tests for specific tactics, as well as the uh, focus on the detection versus mitigation aspects of this. Uh, so from, we have reports available that you can use to uh, filter out the various policy tests and the various uh, detection rules that we have uh, for the various tactics, uh, if you're focusing on a specific tactic on what you're going through. Uh, so focusing on collection versus credential access, and then putting those into dashboards that you can expose and share within Tripwire Enterprise. So from a dashboard perspective, we can expose these reports and graphs to the TE administrators. Here we can see the compliance standpoint for mitigation on the top dashboard, as well as the detection dashboard, and that's your bottom one. Uh, by highlighting the detection aspect, any red pie chart or blip in the changed elements graph might be critical for the information security team to analyze. Uh, in this example here, uh, the organization has quite a few failed policy tests in which they want to, uh, may want to analyze immediately. Uh, however, most organizations are going to go through and focus on either a detection standpoint or a mitigation standpoint, or focus on a, a specific column or so a specific tactic at a time. Uh, so let me describe how an organization would actually go through and adopt the attack framework from what I've seen in my experience. What works well for many organizations is to start with a blank matrix such as this. Uh, there's two ways to tackle it. The first is to take an inventory of your security tools and have them identify what their coverage of the attack framework is. Uh, the problem with this strategy is that a vendor may list the capabilities which may not match how you've deployed their tools. Uh, that being said, it's a good idea to at least have the vendors fill this out uh, so you can get a picture of what your potential coverage might be. Uh, the option I see most often is people focusing on a single column, so a single tactic at a time. For example, focusing on privilege escalation and then working your way through the set of techniques. It's not an easy task to take on. There's lots of techniques, uh, some of which may be more important than others. And the techniques can have a vast set of guidelines for both detection and mitigation. Uh, this is where I recommend trying to follow the CIS hardening guidelines for the mitigation aspects, uh, these, because these guidelines provide detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to secure an asset, 
uh, rather than some of the high-level guidance that you get from ATTACK, for example, leveraging application whitelisting. So be wary about how you go about doing these mitigations uh, that they may need to come from another authoritative source. When validating the mitigation strategies, think of it the same way you would as running a vulnerability scan. Uh, it will tell you where an attacker may get in, uh, but uh, you, know, you may still be blind if they still try and attempt to exploit that specific technique. The more difficult aspect here is going to be the detection portion of the control. Ideally, you can test the defenses by having a red team go through and exploit while, you're, you, know, while you validate those detection strategies. Uh, and there's a couple of good tools that I'll recommend in a minute, which we will discuss. So once you've done that, you're going to end up with something that looks like this. Uh, using the attack framework, you can get an understanding of your enterprise network defense by starting to model uh, an attacker's methodologies against your environment. Uh, you also may want to separate matrices for both mitigation and detecting capabilities, just for simplicity standpoint. Uh, so you want to de uh, define what your current coverage is, so identify the most important gaps in that coverage, and then work towards filling those gaps. And this is a repetitive process, not a one-time project. Uh, very similar to the adaptive security architecture, you've got to continually uh, go through this process. As an example here, we can see the organization may have gone through and assessed their coverage to identify the gaps, and now they'll begin working on addressing those which are most critical. Uh, it's a continual cycle, it's never going to end. Once you have addressed certain gaps, uh, you want to go through to test to make sure that they are actually are covered in a way that you may expect them to be. So use the information in each step to feed the following step, and this will help streamline your efforts uh, to make this process much easier to maintain going forward. When ATT&CK was first released, uh, we were forced to do this type of exercise in something like Excel, and that was painful and tedious, uh, especially when the techniques are mapped across multiple tactics. Uh, so earlier this year, uh, MITRE actually released an open source tool called the ATT&CK Navigator, uh, which allows you to interact with the cells much easier, and there's a link to, to view that uh, navigator here. Uh, even better, you can export your results into a JSON format, and then you can share them with your colleagues or uh, people in a, a similar market vertical as you. Uh, and what's great about it is you can interact with the navigator, uh, and then or use the one that's on the, the GitHub page here, or you can actually download a copy uh, to use on-premise within your or own organization. Uh, so this is what it looks like. In this example here, uh, I went through and uh, mapped out the CIS control to, to the attack framework and color-coded each of these green uh, for each uh, cell or each technique which has coverage. Uh, the process would be the same when mapping the coverage for your own organization. Uh, what I like about this is that we're seeing more threat intelligence report, ma uh, reports map a piece of malware or a campaign uh, to the techniques we're seeing in attack. So by mapping your coverage and over overlaying that intelligence, you can very quickly decide what coverage is adequate and what needs to be looked at. Uh, we'll get into that in a second, but first let me discuss how you would first test your own defenses. There's three resources which are really good for testing your defenses. Uh, the first one, Attack themselves, have released an APT emulation plan uh, based off of real-world attacks. Uh, right now, they're all based off of one, which is APT3, better known as Gothic Panda. Uh, and what it does is it breaks down the attack into a step-by-step -step basis mapped directly to the attack techniques. Uh, the spreadsheet they provide has a great reference of built-in command line functions that you would then enter on an endpoint uh, to then abuse that technique in the same way that the, uh, this APT uh, function did. Uh, they also have uh, functions and modules that you would use in a tool like Cobalt Strike or Metasploit, uh, which can be used to achieve the same goal for that specific technique. So if you have uh, folks in your organization that have expertise in uh, Metasploit or Cobalt Strike, you can then pass that off to them. So it's very easy to go through and uh, sit down one by one and say, we are exploiting technique um, you know, 1053. Um, we ex uh, ex exploited it right now. What do we see from our detection standpoint? Or uh, did it actually mitigate that specific technique? There's another one for, on GitHub called, from Nextron to Systems called APT Simulator. Uh, and it performs a lot of the techniques which are found in attack. Uh, but it's really a spray and, uh, spray and pray, and it doesn't provide a lot of granularity as to what is tested and detected. Uh, so definitely do this on a non-production system, because it's going to go through and change things like your host file and create scheduled tasks and new services. Uh, but it's really good at testing your defenses and detection technology if you don't have a dedicated red team. Uh, the final one is an open source tool called uh, Atomic Red Team. It has a ton of scripts and instructions on a variety of the attack techniques uh, mapped directly to the various techniques. Uh, so when you work towards uh, figuring out your coverage and you want to assess, identify, and, and you know, close these gaps, uh, these tools fit in nicely uh, to, on the execute test function uh, for the, that uh, workflow. 
you can exploit the systems one function at a time in order to determine the coverage for both detection and mitigation. As I mentioned earlier, threat intelligence reports are including mappings to the attack framework. So let's go through a hypothetical attack against a retail establishment and map the attack. In this example, a third-party vendor received a phishing email and clicked on a link, which then harvested their credentials. Using these valid credentials, they deployed a bogus patch uh, with malware to the endpoint systems, uh, their point-of-sale terminals. Uh, the malware then harvested credit card numbers and then sent those numbers uh, up to a st uh, staging server uh, internally on the network. Uh, once they did that, uh, these, files, uh, these staged files were then exfiltrated to an attacker. Uh, so we can take this information and model what they're doing and map that directly to the attack framework. So digging into a tool like the Attack Navigator, uh, we can map out the coverage of our own organization, our sample organization, uh, and then map what the attack looked like uh, from the attack techniques perspective. Uh, from that, we'll know what, what the security operations team needs to do in order to uh, detect if a similar attack has happened, as well as what we need to do to prevent that ha attack from happening in our, our own organization. So here we have the security coverage for a sample enterprise based on the attack framework. So unfortunately, there's quite a bit of holes, which this company still needs to address, uh, but at least they have that baseline understanding of what their current state is. Then we can go through and break down the attack from two slides ago, and we can map what an attacker did uh, to the techniques within this matrix. Uh, so it's a little difficult to see here, but we know that they used uh, spear phishing against a trusted partner, stealing their valid credentials. Uh, application deployment software was used to then distribute the malware, uh, which was then used to remote file copy to send the data elsewhere within the network. Uh, and then a scheduled task was used to exfiltrate the data from the network to a location on the internet. Uh, so these techniques I just mentioned uh, are highlighted here in red. Uh, there's not many, which is great, uh, but individual malware or uh, threat actor campaigns uh, only uses a, a small set of these techniques uh, for each individual campaign. Uh, so what does this look like when comparing it to our organization's coverage of the attack framework? So in this slide here, uh, I've highlighted in green what the organization has coverage for. In this case, it's only scheduled tasks. Uh, unfortunately, an adversary could potential, uh, potentially leverage valid accounts, application deployment software, uh, and transfer data across the network without the company knowing. At this stage, these uh, techniques, which are highlighted in red, would be the most critical uh, to implement uh, mi mitigation or detection strategies for, especially if you're in the same market as the organization who is attacked. Uh, use the tools mentioned from a few slides ago, and you can test your coverage and see if these techniques are already mitigated with existing technologies, uh, or if your logging is good enough that they can detect them within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, using a tool like Triple Enterprise, uh, the content uh, helps out tremendously uh, in this case, as you can quickly get an understanding on the technique-by-technique -technique basis if you're already covered, as well as provide the infrastructure to detect these attacks. Continuing with the example, we can even look at what we're supposed to have coverage for. In this case, um, there's two policy tests for the scheduled task technique, uh, which, is, uh, th which this organization is supposed to have coverage for. However, uh, of the two policy tests, one is passing and the other one is failing. Uh, so do we have compensating controls uh, to be able to address that, or is this uh, something that's acceptable in our organization? In other instances, we have our detection rules. So this is a rule, for example, that is looking at the scheduled task being created. Uh, so is a new scheduled task being uh, created on the system that got uh, exploited? So even though we have coverage for it, we still want to be able to see if an attacker is trying to leverage that attack. So we may not be mitigating it, for example. Uh, however, we have the appropriate infrastructure in place to be able to detect that attack so we can take actions against the adversary uh, in a reasonable amount of time should something happen. Tripper Enterprise has coverage for every supported version of Windows available. Uh, this includes the desktop variants 7 through 10 uh, and the server variants 2008 R2 through 2016. Uh, on the Linux side, we have CentOS 6 and 7 and Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 and 7. Uh, Ubuntu and other Debian flavors are, are shipping soon, as well as the Mac OS X. So if you're interested in playing with the content, uh, you can access all of these policies and rules from the Tripwire Customer Center right now. There's a couple of resources you can look onto our blog for additional information. Uh, the first is a review of the CIS Controls version 7, which was released uh, earlier this year. I went through and provided a detailed analysis of each control, and I provided my own commentary on what I felt was most important and which I felt could be improved upon. Uh, I mention this because a lot of the mitigating factors in the attack framework tied directly to either the 20 controls or the hardening benchmarks uh, also available from CIS. 
Um, the, the next is an exercise I went through, the same thing for attack, uh, looking at the attack framework as a whole, and then going through and analyzing each tactic, so the columns individually one by one. Uh, the first uh, round of that blog series was just released this week, uh, and those will be coming out over the coming days. And, and the last is an exercise I went through of mapping the CIS controls to the attack framework. Uh, there's an excel, excellent poster which is available for the, uh, set, the controls, which map them to the various compliance frameworks. Uh, it's one that we saw earlier today in this webcast. Uh, for many organizations attempting to tackle something new like attack framework or uh, the CIS controls can seem daunting. Uh, however, you're probably already implementing some of, you know, some type of compliance framework within your organization. Uh, so I'm hoping that this can be the bridge from compliance frameworks to the CIS controls to the attack framework uh, to uh, encourage organizations to leverage something like the attack framework. That's what I have for you today. Uh, thank you for your time uh, and hope you've learned something, at least about the, the power of the attack framework. Uh, I urge you, after you're done and close out this webcast today, um, to uh, head over to attack.mitre.org and peruse the vast amount of knowledge uh, that they have in these various techniques. Uh, even for people that have been in the industry for, for quite a while, uh, there's much to be learned from the collective knowledge of the industry. Cyber criminals are sharing knowledge with each other uh, to gain advantage uh, over defenders, and it's time for defenders to do the same thing today. Uh, we'll get in now to some Q&A, uh, so if you have any questions on how to leverage attack in your organization, uh, enter those now and we can get you adopting the attack framework sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Travis, for sharing this excellent information. Um, so now we have time for a few questions. So go ahead and enter them via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Also, we have a one-question survey that uh, we'd really like to hear your feedback. So enter your, uh, you know, click on the survey widget on the bottom of the screen and take that one-question survey, and then Travis will share the results in a few minutes. And also, many of you are asking for the recorded version of this presentation and the slide deck, so I'll be sending out a follow-up email with all of that information post-webcast. All right, Travis, I'll turn it back over to you for some audience questions. Thanks, Kate. So we already have a few questions coming in. Uh, if you have any that you want me to address today, go ahead and enter them in, uh, and I will get to as many as I can uh, with the time permitting. Uh, so the first one we have is asking about the uh, reports uh, and the colors that show there. Uh, specifically, um, do they change color with different events, uh, such as the test result? Uh, and yes, they, they do work exactly as they would with any other tripwire content. Uh, so the policy test themselves will, if the test is passing, uh, then the report will show that specific test or any folder, any test that within that folder will show as green. Uh, and anything that fails, it will show as red. Um, so it'll work exactly like it will either on the policy test tab or from the reports or dashboards or however you are doing the, those types of things uh, in that manner. Uh, the next question here is, do we have support for Amazon Linux? Uh, we do not have support for Amazon Linux uh, itself right now. Uh, it is on the roadmap uh, that we need to look at, um, and it uh, sounds like there is interest, and we'll, we'll prioritize that uh, accordingly. Uh, another one here, the Attack Navigator tool. Uh, is it an app? Uh, the Attack Navigator tool itself uh, is, you can use it in one of two ways. Uh, there was a link on the attack, or on the, on the slides here. If you go to attack.miter.org, uh, there is a link to it as well. Uh, it is on GitHub, and you can, the, the two options are, is you can download it yourself uh, and run it within your own environment, uh, or they do have a, a live version on the, the internet as well that you can interact with uh, without having to install anything in your own environment. Uh, and it's all local, so you're not like sharing um, anything with everybody else that's using there. It's your own individual instance. Uh, so yeah, one of two options, either on-premise or you can use the one that they have up on the, uh, the website. Uh, next one here, uh, do, you, uh, do we have any applications to map to this framework? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by application. Uh, if, there's, if you're talking about things like, uh, like office suites or databases, things like that, uh, not necessarily. There are specific attack vectors within the attack framework uh, that are mapped in there. Uh, so things like uh, exploiting macros in Office, those are mapped directly into uh, the attack framework. Uh, so 
that's pr the extent of the mapping that I have seen uh, from the attack uh, framework itself. Um, next question, uh, does the attack framework overlay severity or impact of uh, TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, relative to others? Um, there is nothing available from MITRE that I have seen uh, that uh, stresses any type of severity uh, or impact. Uh, there is a, a section on each of the techniques that you can see uh, from, the, uh, from the attack framework itself. So if you browse to the attack.mitre.org and look at the technique, uh, it does tell you um, the level of uh, impact that uh, that specific technique would have. Um, I believe it's, uh, uh, what is it? It's, there's permissions required uh, is one of them that will uh, talk about how, you know, what permissions you need to actually uh, exploit this specific technique, um, as well as the effective permissions they do exploit this uh, technique. Uh, what will they gain? So they need user level access to be able to leverage this technique. Uh, and then their effective permissions are, uh, they'd get level or root level uh, uh, permissions. But there's nothing that's saying these ones are, are more important uh, or have a higher severity uh, to the uh, Next one here, um, does the attack framework uh, include machine understandable content? Uh, and how is that leveraged by Tripwire? Um, I'm not quite, under, uh, quite sure how to address this question. Uh, there, are, there are APIs and things like that. Uh, that you can talk to the to gather the attack framework itself. Um, they use, uh, I believe, Six uh, and Cybox to uh, through their API, so you can pull that down. Uh, we don't leverage those in to pull that data directly into the content itself. Uh, we work very closely with MITRE to look at the latest you know, releases as they come out uh, and you know build very in-depth content around that because uh, some of the some of the techniques themselves might be a little bit uh, high level or uh, require a little bit more research to actually directly in a security tool like, like Tripwire. Um, let's see if there's any other good one to address with the time here. Uh, let's see, can you separate the FIM aspect from the policy content? Um, so yes, yeah, so the content itself is split out into uh, two ways. So if you go to the our Salesforce, our Tripwire Customer Center, uh, you can download the content. And there's two different uh, uh, zip files that you'll download when you download. One is the detection rules, as well as the policy, two different zip files that you're going to download for each platform. Uh, the detection is the FIM aspect of the, the security policies. These are just looking at the change. Uh, so if you were uh, seeing the screenshots of what was shown uh, today in the Tripwire tool, uh, that would be the detection folder. These are just looking for FIM changes uh, on the endpoint. Uh, the policies uh, are then uh, split up into the, there are rules that are associated with them. Uh, and those have a severity in the content of set to zero. So, I mean, you're not going to see a red dot if things change. Uh, but those are what the actual tests themselves are going to be. So, looking at uh, this specific uh, registry key changed, and the test is then going to say, is that registry key set to what it should be set to? Uh, so, yes, we do separate those. Uh, so, if you're only interested in detection, you can do that. If you're interested only in the policy side, uh, you can do only that. Or if you're interested in both, you can do both of them as well. Uh, so uh, we have TE for PCI compliance. Will it affect if we load the attack content on the same TE console and test the TE nodes? Uh, the answer is no. It won't affect anything with your PCI compliance. They are uh, separate pieces of content, uh, so there's going to be no. Uh, we're not going to affect the, the way you would uh, be compliant with PCI. Uh, in fact, a lot of the hardening uh, or mitigating aspects of the attack content were pulled from uh, our existing CIS and PCI content as well. Uh, a lot of the mitigating factors that you're going to see within the attack framework itself uh, is going to be you know, leveraging some of the uh, controls from things like the CIS hardening guidelines of the SIGs. Uh, so uh, they're using a lot of the same things. Um, so yeah, it shouldn't affect your, your PCI compliance or the way you would use TE itself uh, on the node. Uh, it's, um, so. With the couple minutes we have left here, uh, I want to go over some of the results that we have from our the survey. So if you haven't taken that, uh, I recommend you do it as well. Uh, so we'd ask you know, what frameworks are most important to your organization, uh, and ask things like uh, hardening guidelines from CIS or DISA, um, the, uh, the critical security controls, the top 20 cr controls from the CIS, uh, various compliance frameworks, TAC framework, or other. Uh, and it looks like a lot of people, 64% um, ish, are mostly focusing right now on the uh, CIS controls, that's the most important. Um, so 
uh, and I, I agree with that. Those are, are some of the most important things you can do, especially if you're looking at the, the top top five or six controls, those basic controls. Uh, they're going to stop a lot of the attacks. All right, that's all, all the time I have for questions right now. Uh, if I didn't get to your question, I will answer it in the, the Q&A widget here. Uh, feel free to follow up with me. I'm happy to discuss this in, in more in depth if you have uh, further questions. Uh, and, and for now, I'll pass it back over to Kate. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Travis, and thanks to our audience for attending today and for all your great questions. We hope you found the presentation informative and useful to you. So as I mentioned earlier, I will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of the webcast as well as the slide deck. Also, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for this webcast, please respond to that email. So we hope you'll join us for future webcasts. Check out our schedule at tripwire.com. And also check out our blog, The State of Security, to find the latest in security news as well as thought-provoking topics, including Travis's blog on the MITRE framework. So we thank you for your attendance today, and have a great day.